Mr. Pai, good evening and thank you very much and congratulations on a great set of thank numbers you. all across uh, the matrices. Let me uh, start by understanding the novelist's uh, performance this time around. It was another record quarter, record for, quarter yes. for novelists. Talk to us how much was it because of favorable market conditions and how much was the profitability improvement coming in because of efficiency which you employed? At the, at I the think company. both played a major role because uh, all the novelist plants are running at full capacity and at uh, good operational efficiency. So that gives you an inherent cost effectiveness. And the macros were uh, very good as well because they use 58% of scrap and the scrap spreads were good. So their metal costs were low. So it's a combination of uh, metal uh, advantage combined with operational efficiency. Mm -hmm. Now that uh, your uh, EBITDA per ton has crossed the $420 or $417 mark, uh, a lot of people are wanting to understand the levels at which it will sustain or how much scope does it have for improvement. Uh, do you have more levers to press there into improvement or you think roughly what range would it uh, so yeah. look, uh, uh, that is always very difficult because one part of it comes from the scrap spreads. But per se, the higher the percentage of auto goes, your EBITDA per ton can keep going higher. Mm -hmm. Now, if once the acquisition closes and you get arrow, that also can make your EBITDA per ton go higher. Mm -hmm. So if we follow through on our strategy of expanding auto, getting into arrow, then your trajectory for the EBITDA per ton can keep going higher. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we interact with some of the large corporates in India who operate in that region, Mr. Baba Kalyani or Mr. Sehgal of Madhasan, they are giving us a great picture about the uh, American auto sector. And hence, uh, it would may, uh, you know, give some uh, color on what the demand scenario is. What is your own observation? Our observation is uh, the same in the sense that aluminization in auto mm -hmm we think is on a uh, sustaining path going forward. And this aluminization is happening in large vehicles and is also happening because of electric vehicles. Both these trends are going to continue. Mm -hmm. So for us, we think that, you know, aluminum usage today is 1.5 million tons on an 80 million ton roll sheet market. So aluminum is only 1.5 million tons of an 80 million, the rest coming from steel. So we think that the expansion of aluminium in auto has got a long way to go mm -hmm. and the we are saying that you're going to see probably a double digit 15 to 16 percent growth in auto sheet for the next five years and this kind of performance you managed to put in despite of some strikes in brazil etc which the analyst community believe uh, as the normalization comes in it will play catch up in the second quarter. Uh, what are your thoughts there? It has already happened in July. So, uh, uh, Novelis, if you listen to the analyst call, said 20 KT got affected because of Brazil, as well as a problem in one of the uh, one of our clients' plants in the US. Already in the first month, because July is over, we have already seen those volumes coming mm -hmm. back. So, yes, we will catch up on the full year on that. Now, let's talk about the exciting part, which is LRS, and the performance over there has been also much ahead of estimates. On the EBITDA per ton, uh, upwards of $250, uh, people believe that, uh, I would say that some of the analysts who were doubting how the profitability would increase from here and now are saying that perhaps the synergies may come in uh, ahead of the estimates. What are your thoughts with this number on the table now? See, we had guided that uh, 360 million of EBITDA in the first year after our takeover. Hmm. And we said that gave us a multiple of 7 point sure. I guess Alaris's last quarter numbers of 85 million have proved that that 360 million is a right. achievable number and probably a conservative number because we have not even put any um, synergies or anything on top. So uh, I think what we just want to say is that we got a great company with great assets at a great price. So which means that there is upside uh, possibility to this number in the next 24 months in your view? Yes, there is upside. If market conditions prevail, we think that there is upside. Mm -hmm. The other uh, reports which you are gathering from Australia is that, again, there are disruption on the supply side. On the alumina, yes. That's correct. Uh, what are your thoughts there? How meaningful can it be and impact on uh, pricing? See, strikes can, you know, Alu Norte in Brazil uh, had a problem. That's why alumina prices went up. Now, there's a walkout in Alcoa plant in yes. Australia, so alumina prices go up. What mm -hmm. that does is that fundamentally it tells you that the aluminium prices have a bias towards the upside because mm -hmm. alumina goes to make aluminium. Correct. So uh, the common question is what is the outlook for LME? And my view is that because 
alumina prices are high, demand is strong, mm. so there is a deficit in the market. China has said that winter cuts will be repeated this year. So I believe that generally LME aluminium prices have a bias towards the upper side in the second half of this year. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned last time around, I, it just got uh, you know embedded in my brain that uh, aluminium is actually the metal of the future. That's correct. The way the transformation or the usage is rapidly increasing in industrial side auto and non-auto. What kind of demand trends are you seeing now with this kind of performance across your assets? Uh, on the table. So India in Q1, because of the general strength of the economy, has shown a 10% uh, increase in aluminium demand quarter on quarter and a 12% increase in copper demand. So my estimates going into the year was 7 to 8%. In Q1, we have seen 10 to 12%. So we think that uh, demand India could be at that inflection point. So if our economy continues with the strength it has, we should be seeing double digit growths in both aluminium and copper. In fact, in this time rounds number also, your Indian operations, aluminum has actually done pretty well. Yes. Uh, copper was single digit uh, growth, but aluminum was very good. Uh, for both these segments, uh, what kind of volume as well as profitability or uh, realizations outlook can you share with us? So aluminum, as you said, we are flat out and what we are trying to do is to maximize the value added. And uh, our costs are being kept tight under control. So we think that aluminum should have a very good year. Copper this quarter was low because we had a planned shutdown mm -hmm. in the smelter. Mm -hmm. So that has now started back. So over the year we will do be at our budgeted volumes. Mm -hmm. So both aluminium and copper should have a very good year. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I wanted to understand from you is that uh, what, is, what is the kind of uh, balance sheet uh, focus you have right now? You did have mentioned earlier that uh, getting the debt levels low on, a, uh, base, on the overall basis uh, one of the priorities and we see that happening now. From here on, what kind of roadmap or schedule would you like to follow at least or aim in reducing the debt? So our net debt to EBITDA at the end of this quarter was 2.57. At the end of last quarter when I met you it was 2.67. We have not repaid any debt in Q1, it's just that the EBITDA went up. Oh, yes. In Q2 we plan to repay 1,500 crores. So our net debt to EBITDA should further increase in Q2. So our plans are simple, the cash we generate, mm -hmm. we are going to use for our organic growth and our maintenance capex mm -hmm. and the rest we will use to repay debt. So in India, I we would like to get the net debt to EBITDA close to the twos. And so that when the LRS uh, acquisition happens, the consolidated net debt to EBITDA mm -hmm. should be in the low threes. So the other thing is that uh, from $250 uh, to a uh, million dollars to 450 uh, analysts are saying that, say, F FY9, 20 uh, and 21 would be when the real synergy will actually start coming in for right. uh, Talk to us about the the process you will undertake and uh, what kind of uh, uh, levers would you press to perhaps enhance or make the process a little speedier. So if you look at it, if it takes us about a year to close mm. the acquisition, mm. our synergies are in two buckets. Mm. One is the traditional synergies which is back office integration, supply chain integration, procurement related. Those we said that we'd be spending about in the first year 35 million one-time cost hmm. to get a benefit of about 60 million in synergies. Hmm. The second synergy was the integration of the China plants. So we have a 200 KT finishing line in Changzhou and we would integrate the Xinjiang facility of Alaris. That we would have to spend about 250 to 300 million of capex to put a coal mill and some finishing lines. That time frame is probably three plus years. Okay. So you should see the first half of the synergy in the first two to three years and the second half of the synergy after three years. So in the five year plan is when the full picture will come. Correct. Sir, now let's broaden the discussion a little bit because you are operating multiple geography yeah. uh, across the country, uh, the world and have your uh, clients also, your big purchasers. Yeah. There is a lot of talk about uh, trade war acceleration and we've seen some part of it play out. Some of your clients will also be directly indirectly get impacted. Do you think that if things worsen from here on, because auto, automobile is a global industry, then some of the estimates may come under shadow or how are you sitting here right now analyzing or building these risks in, in your own numbers? So first thing uh, is important to note that uh, our international business tends to be geographically in one area. So we are not importing or exporting from one continent to the other. So Novellis business in North America is North America, Europe is Europe, China is China. 
So the tariffs, tit for tat tariffs, really has not much impact. Okay. So that's one important point to realize. Now, if there is a general impact on the economy, mm -hmm. of course, it will have some uh, effect on all the companies. But the second point I want to highlight again, 1.5 million on 80 million tons of auto chic. So we don't see the electric vehicle program slowing down. So these are things that are driving aluminization in automotive. So uh, it's very really difficult to say that we won't have an impact, but we believe that the impact on our business should be much less. Right. So are you making a case that perhaps right now uh, we are overestimating the impact which it can have in the near term on businesses and underestimating the tailwinds which your businesses have over the longer I term? I think that's a good way to put it because people when uh, US declared tariffs thought that Novalis will be impacted. And we have been trying to explain that Novalis is a converter business. So any LME plus premiums get passed on in our contracts. So in the short term, again, it is of it's, it has not been negative to us. I, I would guess it has been neutral to us. All and right, in the sir. longer term, as you said, there could be tailwinds. So, but I uh, actually am taking note of this point because you are, uh, have at multiple platforms have emphasized the tailwind which the demand uh, you know potential yes. your business actually hold. So over a longer term period, you think there could be very big uh, impact actually coming into the the profitability can surge very sharply once people really realize how the demand can actually expand? Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't go down to a surge in profitability, but well, let's talk about the fundamentals of the business. In the longer term, that's important. I think that for us to be in aluminium and copper, a large exposure to aluminium in the long run is very good because ultimately the usage of aluminium is going to expand rapidly. If uh, in auto, CAN is going to be steady, more and more planes need to be built in Asia. So we think that the markets that we are participating in very structural are very structural and very secular and we think that you know in the longer 5 to 10 year time frame, these are markets that are going to have a strong demand profile. Right. All right sir, thank you very much for your time and good luck on that uh, road map of yours. We'd love to ca cover your uh, quarter after quarter, see these plans unfold. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.